Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. With Joe McLean and Emily Alcaraz. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. Praise be to God. Good morning to you. Happy Monday. You have made it. You've survived the weekend. You're back at it. Praise be to God. What a week it's going to be. We have a great show lined up for you. You know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of videos have been deleted off of YouTube by YouTube. Many, many channels are being taken off, removed, deplatformed completely. And in the What's Concerning Us section, we'll tell you about what happened to us here at the Catholic Drive Time team on on Friday. Have we been canceled? Have we been um, banned? We'll tell you all about that in the What's Concerning Us section coming up in a moment. Good morning to you, Emily Alcaraz. Good morning, Joe. How was your Divine Mercy Sunday? Uh, Praise be to God, we survived it. I'm teasing. It It was not bad. It was good. It was good. I, I had a great Divine Mercy Sunday as well. And today, it's, it seems like it's going to be a really Dominican-themed day today. I even have a story about a Dominican in our Good News segment later. Is, is that right? You have, a, you have the required Dominican story. Yes. Uh, contractually required, or is it our union rep? I mean, uh, good morning. Speaking of union reps, Adrian Fonsec is here on the ones and twos. Good morning to you. Is that a promotion or more work? Uh, it depends on who you ask. It just depends <laughs> okay. on who you okay. ask. Good. Wonderful, uh, but wonderful. Uh, for whatever reason, we try to sneak in Dominican references as often as possible today. I, you know, I cannot uh, neither confirm nor deny that there's a conspiracy uh, <laughs> and that God may or may not be in on it. A Hashtag, Dominican uh, conspiracy. God signed God OP. <laughs> Well, praise be to God. Hopefully, both of you had great, good uh, weekends this weekend. Did uh, Emily, you spend your time studying? I mean, I know you got some big exams coming up. Yeah, and so I, it's been beautiful out though here. The weather has just been getting so good. So I've been studying out by the pool. Uh, <laughs> okay. Which is semi-effective. Semi-effective. <laughs> well, hopefully, you'll do well in your test then. Prayerfully. I hope so as well, yeah. Be God's will. Mm-hmm. Um, and Adrian, I know you were on a retreat this weekend that uh, I heard went really well. Yes, I was on a retreat with the TFP, Tradition Family Property, uh, over the weekend. My brother went with me, too, so it was a lot of fun. And uh, we went on campaign against um, uh, promoting traditional marriage and against abortion. So that was wonderful as well. And we had the international miraculous pilgrimage statue of Our Lady of Fatima was there with us the whole weekend. So it was a blessing. Praise be to God. Well, amen. We're going to have a great show this hour. We're going to have uh, not only breaking news and stories, saint of the day, gospel of the day. We're going to have a what's concerning us section, lots of stories in the news, including seven Catholic clergy uh, were abducted in Haiti. We'll bring you that story. Plus, what YouTube has, YouTube has, uh, has struck us once again. We'll have that conversation in the What's Concerning Us. But in our guest segment this hour, Father Albert Judy uh, from the Dominicans in Chicago is going to be on our program. He has been translating the uh, sermons of St. Vincent Ferrer into English. And if you don't really know about St. Vincent Ferrer, boy, do I feel bad for you, because he is one of the most incredible saints you're ever going to learn about, and Father Albert Judy is going to tell us all about him in our guest segment today, in this hour. In the next hour, if you're able to join us, we, of course, will have our our game show with uh, new prizes at stake this week from Studio Sen. Our Lady of Guadalupe Canvas Banner is going to be given away this week. Plus the after show and a lot, lot more Catholic Drive Time is headed your way over the course of the next few hours. So hopefully you'll join us for some, all, part, who knows, God's will be done. But let's pray for your intentions today, whatever is on your heart. If you're hanging out with us on a live video feed, feel free to comment your intentions. But uh, your guardian angel and the Holy Ghost know what's on your mind. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now the headlines with Emily Alcrez. The Sunday Mass obligation will be restored for Catholics in the state of Colorado next month. 
unless sick or another grave reason prevents the person from being able to attend mass. A joint statement from the bishops of Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo on April 6th announced that the Sunday and Holy Day Mass obligation will be restored on Pentecost on May 23rd. The bishops urged all Catholics without significant health risks or other serious obstacles to attend Mass every Sunday and to use this Easter season to reflect on the importance of Mass and the Church's teaching surrounding it. <coughs> Excuse me. In their statement, the bishops said, as Catholics, we're invited by God to gather together in community and participate fully in the Sunday Eucharist, which is the source and summit of the Christian life. Catholic Charities Rio Grande Valley on Thursday said a viral video of their work with migrant children on the U.S.-Mexico border is inaccurate and un unauthorized. In the video last week, Alex Jones of InfoWars alleged that a man driving a car with migrant children outside a Catholic Charities humanitarian center in McAllen, Texas, was smuggling the children. The video has been viewed over one million times on Twitter, a social media platform from which Jones remains banned. Sister Norma Pimentel, a member of the Missionaries of Jesus, and executive director of Catholic Charities Rio Grande Valley said in a statement that the illicitly taken video of families and children peacefully entering the humanitarian respite center in McAllen is a contrived misrepresentation of the work of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. A major volcanic eruption in the Eastern Caribbean has prompted thousands to evacuate parts of the main island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Catholics are asking for prayers and for assistance. The La Soufrière volcano on St. Vincent first erupted around 8 a.m. on Friday and covered the island with ash. A second explosion on Sunday caused a massive power outage and cut off water supplies. The eruptions could continue for days or weeks. About 16,000 people live in the red zone on the north of the island of St. Vincent, an area considered the most at risk from volcanic activity. Most of these residents have evacuated. Catholic schools and churches are serving as shelters for evacuees. The Kingstown Diocese said there is an urgent need for mattresses, bed linens, and pillows. It asked local donors to drop off donations at Assumption Cathedral in Kingstown. I'm Emily Alcaraz, and these are your Monday morning headlines through a Catholic lens. Praise be to Jesus Christ in all things. St. David Urbi Valesco, uh, pray for us. He was born on the 29th of December, 1888, in Mexico. He was the son of Juan and uh, Victorina, uh, and the seventh of 11 children in an inevitably poor family. He was baptized on the 6th of January, 1889, entered seminary in 1903 at the age of 14, was an excellent student, but would go on to be ordained on the 2nd of March, 1913. He became a parish priest, as well as the secretary to Bishop Antonio Hernandez Rodriguez of Tabasco. In 1914, David and the bishop were ordered to relocate ahead of the anti-religious violence that was sweeping the country, but their ship sank. David, the bishop, and four others did survive, however, praise be to God, and had a devotion to Our Lady of Tepeyac. On the 30th of July, 1926, as a matter of public safety, due to the violence that was erupting in the country, the anti-Catholic government violence there, the bishops of Mexico ordered a halt to public worship, and the churches were closed. St. David, reluctant but obedient, accepted the order, but later returned covertly to his pastoral duties to provide the sacraments to the people. He was arrested by the military on the 7th of April, 1927. He was offered a deal, however. He was offered freedom if he would become a bishop in a schismatic church that would be subservient to the government. But he declined. Sound a lot like China? Does to me. He wrote his last will and testament on the 11th of April, 1927, and the next day was driven to a remote location where he prayed for himself and his executioners. He gave them his belongings, promised to pray for them in the next life, and then was shot in the back of the head on the 12th of April, 1927. His last will and testament included the words, quote, I forgive all my enemies, and I ask God and whoever I have offended to forgive me, unquote. He was ordained by Pope St. John Paul II, or rather, forgive me, canonized by Pope St. John Paul II 
On May 21st, 2000, St. David Irby Velasco, pray for us. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do this, these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, this is another one of my, you know, I like all of John's Gospel, to be honest with you. It's just... There's never a there's never a dull moment in John's gospel, but I like the I like the sort of the the elements that are going on here in this particular passage. You have Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. If you break down the Greek version of his name, he's he's essentially the people crusher, right? He is the ruler of the people. So you have that going on. Plus, he comes by night instead of day. So you have the people crusher coming by night. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic imagery in your mind. You know, this contrast between uh, Christ and the rulers of the people, light and darkness. It is just awesome. And then to layer on top of that, uh, John, the apostle, puts in some double entendres, right? So a word that has two different meanings. So the word anew could mean ab- again or above. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the word for wind here could also mean the spirit. So you have these elements of water and spirit, and it should evoke in your mind uh, Genesis chapter 1 and the waters of creation. And above that was God's spirit hovering over the waters of creation. And so you see these elements of, of baptism from the dawn of time in sacred scripture being brought to this context to here to tell us this is baptism. But Joe, how could you be sure this is all symbology? No, not really. I mean, just look at the uh, look at the what's going on in front of you. If you read John chapter one, I think it's verse 33, there's baptism going on. Here in John 3, we're talking about da- baptism. And then what happens immediately after this? They go out and they baptize. So you have baptized before, you have baptized after, and you got baptized in the middle. I mean, in fact, the Council of Trent makes it very clear in 1547. They say that this passage is, in fact, referring to baptism. He says, water is no more a metaphor, not a mere metaphor here, but a visible sign of the Spirit's invisible work in the sacrament. So there are very close links here uh, that we see being brought to bear in this passage. It's quite powerful because when we realize what the church teaches about baptism, in other words, Jesus' own words that you must be born again, born from above, that you must be born of water and spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God, this is a, a, a this is like a the line in the sand. We must be baptized. Now, you might say, but Joe, what about the guy on the cross? Was he wasn't baptized? Well, first of all, we don't know. We have no idea if he was ever baptized. The text doesn't give us that information. But we do believe in, in baptism by desire and baptism by blood. But you can't just sit here and go, well, we don't have to give credibility to the sacrament. It's just a symbol. That's clearly not the case. It's not the case from this passage. And it's definitely not the case from the church's patrimony and teaching, as the Council of, uh, of Trent makes very clear in 1547. We must be born again of water and spirit. And that happens only once in your life. Not multiple times. You can only be baptized once. Don't go anywhere after this short break. we got a What's Concerning Us section coming right up. 
Atheists claim they don't need God to be a good person, implying God's not relevant to morality. But is this true? Well, atheists can be good in the sense of knowing behaviors that respect the goods of human nature and living accordingly. St. Paul acknowledges this natural moral law in Romans chapter 2. But this doesn't mean God is irrelevant when it comes to morality. And here's the reason. Besides God's grace being necessary to live the moral law perfectly and merit heaven, God is necessary for the law to be morally binding. How can the moral law be binding if there's no moral law giver behind it that surpasses human authority? The answer is, it can't. So an atheist can follow the natural moral law, but only the theist is consistent in saying that such a law is morally obligatory. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Hi, Joe McLean here, host of the Catholic Drive Time, heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, right here. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of the Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. Real Estate for Life offers their clients a faith-based experience. Real Estate for Life is online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. I have to, if you're hanging out with us on a live video feed, you're seeing this uh, incredibly beautiful, like so dramatic, awesome, scourge or crucified Jesus behind me, thanks to our friend of the show, Jesus Robles, for lending it and letting us display it here. But uh, it's so powerful. I just caught an eye of it in the back corner there behind me. It is uh, a very gripping a statue depiction of our Lord crucified on the cross for you and for me. So uh, I'm just very grateful we're able to have that on the video feed. There are several stories in the news I want to jump into, including whether or not we got canceled by YouTube. Uh, Before I mention that, coming up in about 20 minutes from now, we are going to be diving into the life of St. Vincent Ferrer, a Dominican, uh, a saint that unfortunately not enough Catholics really know much about. But today, our guest, he is uh, a retired Dominican from Chicago. He's going to be on our program. He has been translating St. Vincent Ferrer's homilies, his sermons, into English, making them more accessible. And they are powerful. We shared a bit of one to our email list last week, and it was just a mind-blowing amazing. So we're going to share with you the life of St. Vincent Ferrer coming up in just a few moments. Um, Boy, there's so many articles that I would love to dive into. I'll just mention this. I won't dive into it. Joe Biden tells America to stop praying. I don't think that's what he meant, but boy, did that come across wrong. He he feels now is the time for action. No more praying. Like the wrong message to send for a Catholic to the world. Please. Praying is the most powerful, effective tool you have in your disposal, in your arsenal. There is no more powerful tool than, than praying, fasting, and doing penance. But I don't think, again, I don't think that's what he meant. Portland under siege. Uh, Portland rioters barricade door and set fire to ICE building with federal agents inside. Burn, quote, burn the precinct to the ground, unquote. Gotta love it. Of course, there's no new riots in in Minnesota now because there was another police-involved shooting. It just uh, seems never-ending. And then, of course, uh, the Christians. Remember we reported last week about that church in Canada that that the police fenced off and blocked the door. Well, I think the, the, the people, the congregation came out to tear the fence down. They sent police with two, 200 police in riot gear to stop them from doing it. Yeah. Let that sink in for a moment. Then there's the story about us. So on Friday, after we had left for the day, uh, YouTube was gracious enough to send us a notice that we had taken another hit. So you might recall last week we we had Patrick Coffin on. He was canceled off of YouTube for, for an event he was trying to run, you know, for basically questioning the official narrative of things. And you're not allowed to talk about that on the platform, apparently. Like, you, it is verboten. And if you're going to be on their platform, you have to follow their rules. You're not allowed to question the narrative. 
So we had him on to talk about why he was canceled, what were the circumstances, and we took a hit for it. We Both of our channels took a hit. So on Catholic Drive Time side, Adrian, we were actually suspended for a week, right? Yes. So the slight distinction between the two channels, our GRN online channel, which is where we stream to, just got a warning. So this is our first warning. Um, oddly enough, our Catholic Drive Time YouTube channel, where we post the clips of our interviews, ha- is on its first strike, meaning we cannot live stream there for a week. And I think that means we can't upload, though I checked, and it seems like it's giving me the option to upload. So I'll be finding out for sure how exactly what the rules are today when I try to upload this one. Um, and we'll find out for sure how that works. But for our GRN online channel, we only have a warning now so we can continue streaming. But should we get another strike, um, then that means we are suspended for a week. If we get a second strike, we're suspended for two weeks. And then three strikes and you're out, they delete your channel uh, completely. So that's kind of where we stand at the moment. And so we really need to be very aware of what's going on. Uh, so if you don't see us, we are planning on broadcasting unless the world ends. Uh, we're planning on broadcasting <laughs> every day, uh, Monday through Friday, and we will let you know if anything changes from that. But if you don't see us on streaming online, well, now you know why. Yeah. It is uh, a unique time, for sure. One we've been talking about quite a bit. You know, um, it, we, we have one foot in both worlds here at the Catholic Drive Time. On one hand, we have our foot firmly in the Catholic radio world. We're live broadcasting across the Station of the Cross. Good morning to you, Massachusetts and New York and Pennsylvania and Northern Ohio. Good morning to you, Alabama, Florida. Good morning to you, Virginia and Maryland, Washington, D.C. Good morning to you, Texas, New Mexico and Kansas. Uh, Praise be to God for the opportunity to to broadcast across Catholic radio stations. Um, But we also have a foot in the digital world. And I hate to tell you this, but the world is being pushed fast and furious now into a completely digital world. And in in that world, we have very little say over who gets to be the winners and losers, who gets to have access and who doesn't. With a click of a mouse, uh, somebody at a platform can decide you no longer have access to the audience. Now, we have backups. The Gab, for instance, we're posting to Gab. I, po- I cross-post to all kinds of platforms like Parler and, uh, and we're, uh, Rumble. I, meant, we, I said Gab, but I meant Rumble. But I cross-post to Gab as well. So Rumble, Gab, Parler, Gloria TV, Twitter, Facebook. I mean, there's a bunch of places we're cross-posting. Not all of them. Uh, there's, we have pretty limited resources here. But we are cross-posting. And there's a brand new site that's going to be rolling out this week called Frank TV. We're looking at setting up there as well. But here's the reality. The va- I mean, there's, there's more than a billion users on a platform like YouTube. There is not more than a billion users anywhere else on any other platform. And every other competitor on the video side can't even scratch the surface when it comes to competing alongside YouTube for, their, uh, for the platform functionality and for the access to the audience. Absolutely, Joe. And the, uh, it's just to illustrate the point... Our most popular video on our Catholic Drive Time YouTube channel, which is a new channel that we created, only has about 200 subscribers. Our largest video has over 1,000 views, and our biggest video on Rumble has only 100 views. So it just shows you the great disparity between the two channels um, and the two different platforms. It's just night and day. You just do not get the traction. You're not reaching these amount of souls that you could be reaching. Uh, so it is, it, is, it is very important that we be on these public platforms that, are, that hate us because we are trying to evangelize the culture, the salvation of souls, and the liberty and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. And the other thing is we, we can't also – we can't duck the responsibility to talk about the issues that need to be talked about. Um, you know, in my, in my opinion, Catholic Radio does not get enough credit for talking about the, the hard issues – and I think that's that's not fair. We've been dealing with the vac- you know, the vaccine issues now for for two years with expert level guests. Uh, scandals in the church. Yeah, we've covered those. Vigano, absolutely. I interviewed Vigano a few years ago, and so I, I remember I had Timothy Gordon on afterwards to to follow up as long as as well as many others. The China issue. We've been dealing with that. Uh, we we dealt with Black Lives Matter and Antifa and the January six riots. I mean, we've been dealing with all of the major issues, and we haven't really pulled any punches, as far as I could tell, uh, on any of the issues. 
we've had uh, we've talked about the CCHD and and uh, we've had Lepanto on several times. Christine Niles from from Church Militant. We've been dealing with these issues quite a bit, so we can't shirk that responsibility either. But the reality is, this is why supporting Catholic Radio is so important. This is why. Uh, when Catholic Radio comes and says, hey, please help us keep the doors open, the lights on in Catholic Radio Waves, you decide to pull out your credit card or your checkbook or whatever, your pennies out of the couch, and you call it in because it's necessary to keep us on the airwaves for as long as possible because the day may come when that may no longer be possible. In which case, how does the Catholic evangelist reach the masses to share the good, the true, and the beautiful for the salvation of souls and for the greater glory of God? Well, we're going to have to adapt. It's not going to be easy. One of the ways that we're doing it is trying to get live video streams straight into our mobile app so that uh, you can go to our platform versus their platform. Their meaning, you know, Google, YouTube, that kind of thing. So we're looking for ways. We're constantly finding, trying to find new ways, new opportunities to reach the masses. And you, my dear listener, can be a big part of that success by supporting the Catholic Radio Apostle that you're listening to right now, financially. Station of the Cross, Guadalupe Radio Network. Support them. That local Catholic radio station you're plugged into, are you supporting them? Are you volunteering your time, your talent, your treasure? Please consider that. That would be huge. Um, so interesting days ahead. We don't know uh, how long we'll be able to stay on those platforms. No idea. God's will be done. God's will be done. But we're not going to stop talking about the issues just because they don't like it. We have to. It's our, it's our, it's our mission. But it's also a sense of charity to the world, to the souls that need to hear the truth. And sometimes truth is painful, and it still needs to be said. And questioning the official narrative is is part of the process sometimes. Um, speaking of crazy stuff that goes on that we have to deal with, I know, Adrian, uh, part of your retreat experience uh, included that, and there's more coming. Absolutely. Uh, last year, this time last year, there was a drag queen show at A&M University, and I went out there to help support the group of Catholics out there at A&M to protest the drag queen show. And it's happening again this Sunday, uh, Dragyland Part 2. And it's um, going to be a drag queen show at the A&M campus. And the sad thing is, a friend of mine, I won't give out the details, I don't want to, um, I didn't ask him if I could say his name, so uh, he was uh, fired or asked to resign from St. Mary's because he was going out to protest a drag queen show. Wow. And St. Mary's was like, no, we don't want to be divisive. We don't want to push uh, any buttons. So we're just going to, you know, have a have a talk at St. Mary's the same time the drag queen show is happening. And my friend, because uh, he was going out there and protesting and because he was getting a group of students to come out to protest, was asked to resign. And uh, that breaks my heart that one of the greatest Catholic um, sinners in the U- in the United States of America at A&M University uh, is acting that way. That that breaks my heart um, because this is a it, there more vocations come out of St. Mary's at A&M than any Catholic university, and which is mind blowing. So it, it really is a huge hit to um, to what's going to the to the Catholic faith. Yeah, imagine imagine if you you lived in a fortified city, and the uh, the invaders were at the gate surrounding your city, and you knew that things were going not looking good. Your food supplies, your water supplies are running out, and they are bombarding the walls, and any minute they're going to break through, and then who knows what will happen then. Would you not defend yourself? Would you not defend your loved ones, your neighbors even, strangers in your town? Would you not defend them? Well, then, let me tell you, with this issue of the of uh, of the diabolical con- confusion in our world and in our communities surrounding us, that is the enemy at the gate, and they are barging through and breaching our walls. And your neighbors, your friends, your family, your own children, their lives, their souls are at stake. And if we don't defend, not just for their sake, but also out of great charity and love for those that are twisted and and, and, and contorted in this crazy diabolical confusion, boy. Souls and eternity, that's the stakes of this game. And it's time that Christians and Catholics have a sense of their duty to defend uh, truth in a world that really needs to be spoken to and dealt with. And we're not trying to do that out of a sense of uh, animosity, but out of a sense of charity. It's our duty. At any rate, so we haven't yet been canceled, but 
the day is early. Who knows what will happen later today? So please do us a favor and get connected to our email list. That's a great way to stay in touch no matter what happens. You can sign up at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. We'll be right back. St. Vincent Fair, the Miracle Workers coming up. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Psalm 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. What does that mean? Don't hang around with bad people? No. According to G.K. Chesterton, it means something much better than that. He says that there are certain people who, because they are really pure, create a good atmosphere around themselves. They are truly children of light, and the light shines on everything they touch. When a righteous person stakes out a clear position, we recognize that it's something solid and vital and eternal. So it's not that hanging around bad people makes us bad. It's that being righteous can help make the people hanging around us righteous too. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Show. Heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central and 7 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations, offering their clients a faith based experience. They are online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. Welcome back to the Catholic Drive Time Show. Today's Monday, April 12th, and these are your headlines for today. New Mexico's governor on Thursday signed a bill legalizing assisted suicide in the state. Governor Michelle Grissom signed the Elizabeth Whitefield End of Life Options Act, named for a late state district court judge who died of cancer in 2018 and who became an advocate for assisted suicide in her final years. The bill allows physicians, physicians assistants, nurse and nurses to prescribe a lethal dose of medication for terminally ill patients who are deemed capable of self-administering the dose. New Mexico is now the eighth state to have legalized physician-assisted suicide, along with California, Colorado, Hawaii, Montana, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. The District of Columbia has also legalized the practice. The state's Catholic bishops had strongly opposed the bill, which was passed by the House in February and by the Senate in March, largely along a party line vote. Alleging embezzlement of over $200,000, federal prosecutors have filed charges against John Lynch, a former executive of the historically Catholic Michigan nonprofit Holy Cross Children's Services. The investigation was prompted when an employee noticed apparent personal expenses in Lynch's use of the Holy Cross credit card. Lynch was fired in April of 2017. The charity's former CEO and chief financial officer, The 56-year-old Lynch is accused of stealing more than $240,000 from the charity and allegedly spent it on shopping sprees, vacations, and expensive dinners. The the Detroit News reported, if if convicted, sorry, he faces federal charges of mail and wire fraud, crimes both punishable by up to 20 years in prison. He's also accused of stealing money from an organization that receives federal funds, a felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison. And a documentary being released on Benedict XVI's 94th birthday states that his personal secretary tried to dissuade him from abdicating the papacy. Benedict XVI, the Pope Emeritus, directed by Andre Garrigo, will be released on April 16th by Goya Productions. The film will focus on Benedict's papacy and his time as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. At that time, Pope Benedict had to deal with such crises as liberation theology in its Marxist version with its affinity to guerrilla warfare and the cases of pedophilia that were beginning to surface then. Elected in 2005, Benedict was faced with two immense tasks defending Catholic doctrine from the dictatorship of relativism on the outside and reforming the church from within, starting with the confusing structure of Vatican finances. The producer said that the film discusses Archbishop Gonswain's attempt to dissuade the Pope from abdicating, to which the Pope replied that he had prayed and there would be no going back. 
I'm Emily Alcaraz, and these are your Monday morning headlines through a Catholic lens. Praise be to Jesus Christ in all things. Thank you, Emily, for keeping us up to date on the news. I want to thank everybody who is hanging out with us on the live video stream today. It is very important to us uh, that you are there. And do us a favor and, and smash that share button and the like and all of that. It really does help us to overcome the algorithms and the troubles that we have to reach a new audience. So Patty and Michelle and Luz and Glenn, thank you for sharing. And uh, Betty, welcome to the show. We're very grateful that you've commented for the first time. Well, in the after show, we we give a little extra special praise to God for for that. But uh, well, that'll be coming up next hour. So anybody who can join us on a live stream, please do share. It does make a big difference to us. But joining us right now via Zoom chat all the way from uh, sunny Chicago is Father Albert Judy O.P. of the Dominican Order. He is uh, retired, but he has been in- incredibly translating the sermons of St. Vincent Ferrer into English, making them more accessible. And let me tell you, St. Vincent Ferrer, is an amazing saint of the church, and we're so very glad to have Father Albert here to tell us all about it. Good morning to you, Father. Good morning. Good morning. Praise be to God. Uh, good morning and happy Easter to you. Uh, saint Vincent Ferrer. Now, you know, I, when I first discovered this saint a few years ago, I, my mind was blown because I'd never heard of him. He doesn't get a lot of press, but he is one of the most incredible saints in the church's patrimony. Um, let's start by maybe giving us the bio background on St. Vincent. Well, Vincent uh, was born in 1350. And this is kind of like an in-between century. Uh, the, the famous uh, 13th century was the age of, of Thomas Aquinas and Albert the Great and St. Dominic and Francis and this is, uh, he was born about 150 years later, by which time the great orders of St. Francis and Dominic and St. Dominic were flourishing in Europe. Now, the Dominicans are called the Order of Preachers, and Vincent turned out, at the end of his life anyway, to be a kind of a paradigm of a preacher. He was born in 1350, which is about the time when the Great Black Death was spreading across Europe. We talk about a pestilence today, which has caused 3 million deaths worldwide. They estimate that the Black Death in 1350, around that time, caused 25 to up to 200 million Europeans die. Hmm. But anyway, uh, this is the world he, he grew up in. He was born in Valencia. That's on the uh, east coast of, of Spain, uh, the Costa del Sol region. Uh, from a moderate uh, uh, and noble family, and uh, he was pious, and he uh, he found himself having a vocation to the priesthood, and there the Dominicans in Valencia were the ones who who got him to sign up. And he uh, proceeded to be trained in Valencia and Barcelona in the schools of the Dominicans, and eventually was uh, studied theology and was ordained. He was very bright, and uh, had, had wrote a couple of works in philosophy, taught some philosophy, and then eventually was teaching theology for the Dominicans in Barcelona when uh, a bright young friar, uh, eloquent as well, caught the attention of the great bishop there, uh, Pedro de Luna. And the bishop kind of took him into his entourage as kind of a personal chaplain. And for the next 15 or so years, St. Vincent Ferrer was kind of like a chaplain to the rich and famous. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it, he, did, he wasn't a preacher then. At that time, the papacy was, divi- it was, was divided because of a curious election that, of a pope that took place in Rome surrounded by crowds of people uh, demanding that an Italian be elected. And so the cardinals elected someone, got out of town, and most of them said this was an illegal election. And so they elected a second pope, and the second pope lived in Avignon in France uh, on the Rhone River uh, in southwest, southeastern France, and the other pope was in Rome, and we had what we call the Great Western Schism. For a generation, there were two popes. And uh, Vincent Ferrer was associated with this bishop from Barcelona, Pedro de Luna. And when the first of the Avignon popes died, they elected uh, Pedro as the second, Benedict the Thirteenth. 
Now, meanwhile, there was a pope in Rome as well. So it was a terrible time for the church. Now, uh, there, was, there were arguments that could be made that it was an illegal election that was, it was elected under, under uh, force or a, th a threat of force. In any case, uh, Vincent Fair became uh, a patron and a promoter of the Avignon pap papacy. His friend was a pope. It happened, though, that while he was with the papal group in the castle in Avignon, he became very ill. He must have got some version of the plague. And uh, at age 49, having uh, had this great career among the rich and famous, I would say, he fell into a fever. And in the fever, as he describes it later, he sees the Lord himself coming with St. Francis and St. Dominic to him and calling upon him to really seize upon his vocation of preaching. And the Lord reaches out and touches him in his ill feverish illness, and he's cured, according wow. to the story. And so he decides to reform, his, to, to really take up the preaching mission. And for the next 19 years, till his death, he became, well, I, I describe it as the Billy Graham of Europe. <laughs> and and he, would, he would bring his, his mission, his preaching crusade to a town for a week. And uh, so many people would listen to him, would want to hear him preach. After he would say Mass in the morning, he would preach from 9 till noon. And there were so many people they couldn't fit into the churches, so they built a pulpit outside the church on the steps of the church so he could speak to the crowd in, in the city uh, city area. And uh, thousands heard him that way, and they were moved by his, uh, his, uh, uh, his rhetoric, his passion, and his uh, intelligent and wonderful sermons. It's just, this, this crusade became such that he would have to travel from town to town with a team of eight or nine confessors to hear all the confessions wow. that his preaching would be. And, and as it turned out, the people who, who were moved by him would follow him from town to town. I mean, <laughs> it, was a, it was a Grateful Dead concert, you know, by a preacher <laughs> in the 14th century. So that was what he did most of the time. Uh, for the rest of his life. All right, hold that thought. Father Albert Judy O.P. is with us to talk about the incredible life of St. Vincent Ferrer. Now, that's sort of like the, the biographical background data, but uh, the miracles, that's going to blow your mind. We're going to have a conversation about that, plus the work of translating from his sermons into English on the other side of this very short break. St. Vincent Ferrer, pray for us. We'll be right back. If you had the chance to sit down for 10 minutes with the world's greatest teacher, would you take it? One Minute Monk, Abbot Placid Solari of Belmont Abbey. If you said yes, you're in luck. Go take out your Bible, and you can spend 10 minutes or even more with the Spirit of the Living God. Who has a better teacher or greater expert than the Holy Spirit? In his rule, St. Benedict sends us to the Bible every day, and it's free. 2 Timothy tells us all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness. If we truly believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, what holds us back from turning to it each day? For your free copy of The Rule of St. Benedict, visit OneMinuteMonk.com, O-N-E, MinuteMonk.com. If we truly believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, what holds us back from turning to it each day? Hi, I'm Emily Alcaraz, and I'm the co-host of the Catholic Drive Time Show, which airs from Monday to Friday at 6 a.m. Central Time. I'm excited to announce our partnership with our new underwriter, Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life offers a faith-based experience while supporting the gospel of life. They work with over a 1,000 pro-life agents worldwide and generously support a variety of pro-life organizations. Their website is realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. 
keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joel McLean. It is so good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Father Albert Judy OP is on the program today. He's a retired Dominican out of Chicago. So let's not hold that against him. Uh, but he's here to talk about the, uh, the life of St. Vincent Ferrer. He's been translating his sermons from, uh, I guess it's in Latin, into English, but he'll tell us more about that in a moment. Uh, welcome back to the show, Father Albert. I want you to talk about the miracles. Sure. This man had tens of thousands of miracles to his credit in his lifetime. And I know that at uh, when he was, uh, I think it was canonized, they read an account of at least 800 of the miracles during the canonization yeah. process. So tell us about the miracles of St. Vincent Ferrer. Well, uh, uh, we, he, he lives in an age which has had a lot filled with faith and maybe not so much science. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't have very many uh, uh, miracles to give you an example of because I think the miracles was his, his preaching myself and the many, many thousands of people he converted. Uh, there's a famous uh, story, uh, some woman wrote a dissertation on it that, that said that when he was in Brittany, uh, there was a woman and her family, and she was a little crazy, as it turned out. And one day, out of rage, she took her baby and chopped him up into pieces and was about to serve him in the meal, mm. about to cook him up. When he was called upon, he brought, came back and took everybody out of the house, and the next thing you know, the baby was back together again. <laughs> so that, that was really remarkable. Uh, I don't know whether... Uh, they could prove that. There were many times he was accused. Of, he was not. He, he attributed to him raising people from the dead. Mm. Uh, one famous episode came from the fact that he had associated himself with the angel that we find in in Revelation fourteen seven, the first angel that is said that is sent to the world to announce it that the day of the judgment has come. Fear the Lord. And, and give him honor because the day of the Lord judgment is coming. And in the story is he was preaching one day and, and people were wondering whether he was the angel of the apocalypse. And he says, tell this woman, there's somebody who died at the other end of town. Have her come over, bring her over here. And she brought her over here. And he looked at the lady and he says, am I the angel of the apocalypse? And the lady lifted up and says, yes, you're the angel of the apocalypse. I'm ready to I've already said this. And so he said, oh, thank you. And so she died again. So that was a crazy story. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, there are many other miracles, of course, of, of healings and so forth. But mostly they were healings of, of, of the soul of those who listened to him preach. You know, it happened that some years ago, yeah. uh, I came across a, a volume, a very old book, a set of three books. This was printed and distributed in 1570. St. Wow. Pius V, Pope Pius V, could have read this for his meditation. And it's a collection of his <laughs> wow. sermons. 400 of his sermons in Latin were, were written here. Now, he preached in Catalan, in Spanish, but in order to distribute his sermons to all of Europe, they translated it into a common Latin that people could understand. And by coming into contact with this, I decided wouldn't be wouldn't it be interesting to translate these sermons so that we could see what the faith was of these people in the in the 14th and the early 15th century. And so I did, and I found out that they are wonderful sermons based upon the gospel, the literal text of the gospel, uh, using the Vulgate translation, which we have in our Douay Reims translation. Uh, our modern translations are often a little bit different. And he would begin his sermon uh, and would announce his, he would announce the, uh, the text of the sermon and his theme, and then he would invite everybody to say the Hail Mary with him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, in those days, that's as far as the Hail Mary went. They didn't add the second half until the end of the, of the 15th century. So he would invite everybody to pray to Mary as they began to listen to his sermon. And so he would expound the literary uh, uh, text, uh, the literal meaning of the text, the description of it, 
And then he would get sometimes say, morally speaking, now and then he would make a practical application. For example, the uh, uh, in the in the uh, his sermon on the Annunciation, uh, he talks about this angel speaking to the Virgin Mary, and you see that's kind of shocking, isn't it? And then he says, morally speaking, note here, you you young women. Uh, what sh what should you say if a stranger comes up and talks to you? You know, you could probably say, uh, you don't have to reply unless by saying, what do you have to do with me, sir? Because such a greeting is unseemly. But, but then he says, if the person should say, you lily blossom, you paradise flower, you gracious <laughs> angel, you are my life, and so forth, you should tell him to take a hike. <laughs> now, now that's the kind of practical uh, insight we have. But when I looked at his sermons, most of them are really an appeal to go through the stages of conversion. When he speaks uh, of the raising of Lazarus at 12 hours, there's a reference, Jesus says, there are 12 hours in the day. And Vincent turns it into 12 steps of conversion, like our 12 steps. Acknowledgement of sins, contrition of the heart, purpose of amendment, the avoidance of the occasions of sin, oral confession, always oral confession was mentioned, bodily penance, spiritual prayer, almsgiving, repayment of debts, forgiveness of injuries, the restoration of another's good name whom you have harmed, and finally it ends up with Holy Communion. And that was his agenda. No matter what text he found, he would find a way of coming up with a list of the stages of repentance leading to Holy Communion, confession and communion. And that's something that uh, counts for us as well. Father, well, Father Albert, Judy uh, O.P. is our guest. Go ahead, Adrian. Yes, Father, this, uh, I've been, I came across his sermons recently a few months ago, and I've been reading them uh, for the Sunday Gospels, and it's just been all striking to me how how beautiful it is that he, what he's written. It's been very spiritually edifying for me. Are you going to continue uh, translating them? I know there's so many <laughs> yeah, sermons well, there. How long is it taking you? Well, I did this 20 years ago, and I've been doing other things since. Uh, and it certainly would be good to get back. There are, on my website, SVF for St. Vincent, for SVF Sermon, one word, dot org, 50 of his sermons that I've translated out of the 400. I'll never live long enough to do the rest. <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to share one more thing with you if I can. Can I do that? Sure, go ahead. And th this is, often he would provide a dialogue for the people that, of an event that took place in the gospel. And uh, one of these most beautiful and appropriate to this season is he raises a question in his sermon on Easter. You can look it up on the website, svfsermon.org. His sermon on Easter asks the question, did Jesus ever appear to his mother Mary? And he says, the Gospels don't tell us that, but the fathers of the church seem to think that he did. And so he said, you know, maybe it could have happened this way. He said, Mary is in the guest room at, at, of Lazarus and Mary and, in Bethany. He, she's in the guest room. That's where we're staying on that night after the crucifixion. And she was saying, she was the only one who believed. That's why Saturdays are holy to Mary. Vincent says she was the only one who still had faith in his resurrection on Saturday. Everybody else was confused. And so and she's looking through scriptures to see when he would rise on Sunday. And finally, she finds a passage that says at dawn he would rise when light breaks. And so she looks out the window and she said, well, it's, the dawn is coming. He's about to rise. And so I've got to get ready. I, I've got to find a chair for him to sit in the room here when he comes and visit me. And so as it says, and Christ immediately sent the messenger Gabriel to the virgin saying, just as you announced to my mother the incarnation, now announce to her my resurrection. And with unbridled great joy, uh, he, Gabriel, came to the Virgin, saying, Queen of heaven, rejoice, hallelujah. 
earth, because he whom you did merit to bear, hallelujah, has risen, as he said, hallelujah, as was revealed, and as it was revealed to blessed Gregory the Great, the Pope, who added, pray for us to God, hallelujah. That's the Regina Chaley. That's the antiphon we say in place of the Salve Regina to end, end the office every day during Easter season. And he puts it on the lips of, of Gabriel, which is most appropriate. Think mm. of that. Amen. We are almost out of time. Father Albert, Judy sure. has been our guest. Uh, we have about a minute and a half left uh, with you. Now, where, where can people go? You, you mentioned the website a minute ago. Can you, can you give it to us again? Uh, I want to encourage right. everyone. You know, I know a lot of people who don't want to dive too deep in their faith. They don't put a lot of effort. This is worth it. Meditate upon the lives of the saints and their sermons. It's so powerful. Where do we get that uh, information, Father Albert, Judy? Well, the website is up, and you, it'll come to you if you look for St. Vincent Ferrer Sermons. But the web, uh, the website is svfsermons.org. svsermons.org? SVF, St. Vincent Ferrer. St. Vincent Ferrer, S-V-F, as in Ferrer, St. Right. Vincent Ferrer. Praise be to God, uh, Father Albert Judy, thank you for being on our program today. We're very grateful to you. God love you. God bless you, okay. Father. Have a great day. And uh, once again, thank you for being on to share this incredible life of this uh, wonderful saint to us. And hopefully everybody will check out the website and read these sermons. They're very powerful. In fact, Adrian read that section of that homily on uh, last week's uh, Reflection on Sunday Gospels, and we sent that to our email list. Hopefully you got that. If you didn't, let us know. We'll, we'll get it to you. But uh, that's going to do it for hour number one of Catholic Drive Time. Praise be to God. We're very grateful to everyone who was able to hang out with us. If you can hang out with us in the next hour, we will have breaking news and stories, Saint of the Day, Gospel of the Day, plus our tr Fear and Trembling Game Show. Brand new prizes are at stake this week, and your chances to win are up. Up, uh, coming up in just a little bit. Plus, an after show, we will dive into your questions, including Tony's, who wants to know what translations and what uh, commentaries we use. All that coming up in the next hour. If you can join us, we'd love to have you. We'll see you then. Thank God love you. God bless you. On your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. The Bible clearly says that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but the Catholic Church teaches that Mary was a perpetual virgin. How can that be? Mark 6 verse 3 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Point number one to consider. There was no word for cousin or for nephew or for niece, aunt, uncle in ancient Hebrew or Aramaic. The words that the Jews used in all those instances were brother or sister. An example of this can be seen in Genesis 14, 14, where Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, is called his brother. Another point to consider, would the last thing that Jesus did on earth be to grievously offend his surviving brothers? Right before Jesus dies, John 19 tells us that Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to the apostle John. If Mary had any other sons, this would have been an incredible slap in the face to them that the apostle John was entrusted with the care of their mother. Also, we see from Matthew 27, 55 and 56 that the James and Josephs mentioned in Mark 6 as the brothers of Jesus are actually the sons of another Mary. And one other passage to consider, Acts 1 verses 14 to 15 speaks of a company of about 120 persons that consist of the apostles, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now let's see. There were 11 apostles at the time. Jesus' mother makes 12. The women, probably the same three women mentioned at the crucifixion in Matthew 27, but let's say it was maybe a dozen or two, just for argument's sake. That puts us up to 30 or 40 or so. So that leaves the number of Jesus' brothers at about 80 or 90 according to this scripture passage. Do you think Mary had 80 or 90 children? She would have been in perpetual labor. No, scripture does not contradict the teaching of the Catholic Church about the brothers of Jesus when scripture is interpreted in proper context. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. 
Odyssey begins at the University of Dallas, the premier Catholic liberal arts university in Texas. With campuses in Irving and Italy, UD's rigorous core curriculum sets it apart. An education rooted in the great works of Catholic and Western tradition. An education that ennobles and enables students in their pursuit of wisdom, truth, and virtue. Undergraduate, graduate, and certificate programs available. Start your college odyssey at the University of Dallas today. Go to udallas.edu to learn more. Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. With Joe McLean and Emily Alcaraz. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is so good to be on with you. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. We're going to have a great show this hour. Looking forward to it. Brand new opportunity at uh, the game show is coming up. Brand new prizes, in fact. We're looking forward to uh, giving stuff away again this week. It's always a lot of fun being on the game show. You know, it, it, the only stress comes in whether or not I picked too hard of a question. Because uh, that's a stressor. But you know what? The good news is the listener doesn't really technically need to even know the answers to get them right. That's how the game is played. So that'll be coming up in a little bit. And then, of course, we'll have uh, breaking news and stories. And this hour, it's all good news. We don't even share the bad news. That was last hour. This hour, it's all good news, plus Saint of the Day, Gospel Day, and a an after show where you, my dear listener, get to drive the conversation. And Tony on Facebook side wanted to know what we use for commentaries on the scriptures. And we'll talk about that in the after show. Uh, good morning to you, Emily Alcarez. Good morning, Joe. I loved our last interview last hour, Father Albert. Wow, what a good soul. Now, is that because so is that because he's from Chicago? Uh, and that might have a little something to do with it, but not too much. Is it because he's Dominican? <laughs> oh, that might also have something to do with it. I mean, it. like, there's a lot of biases <laughs> going on here. Speaking of biases, uh, Adrian Fonseca is on the ones and twos this morning. Good morning to you. I am incredibly biased when it comes to Dominicans. So <laughs> no, it was you a, don't I, say. You know, I, I know it might shock some what? people. I know it might shock people, but I like Dominicans. It's a, it's a fact. I know. I'm sorry. Maybe um, it was the bumper sticker that gave it away. Was it the bumper sticker? Says, or was it, like was it the black and white that I wear every day? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's something there for sure. But uh, St. Vincent Ferrer, incredible, amazing saint, and Father Albert Judy OP was on the program last hour to share his life and his work in translating his, uh, did you say 400 sermons? 400 sermons. And he said that they would probably have been read by Pope Pius V, uh, Pope St. Pius V. Kind of cool. A Dominican pope, uh, by the uh, way. You're not... Okay. Maybe the greatest pope ever. I'm noticing a probably, trend here. Probably. I'm noticing. I'm noticing a slight trend when it comes to Dominican stuff. But anyway, okay. So that that, that interview will be posted later today. Well, not on Maybe Catholic not on Drive Time because we got. We got blocked there for a week, so we'll be discussing more of. We discussed that last hour, but maybe that'll come up in the after show today. Uh, but we will post it to Rumble, Facebook, and elsewhere if we can. So make sure that you get all the links to our social platforms on our website, grnonline.com forward slash cdt. But YouTube, uh, YouTube laid the heavy handed discipline on us on late Friday because we dared to conversate about something they do not approve of. So uh, we'll be posting that elsewhere. Again, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. All right. In this hour, of course, our Fear and Trembling game show is coming up, plus the after show. A lot to do to this hour. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us for all or part of that. And we're very grateful that you are here, in fact. Let's pray for whatever is on your heart, on your mind, whatever your needs are, and uh, ask Our Lady, Queen of Heaven and Earth, to intercede for all of us today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now the good news with Emily Alcaraz. One of the positive outcomes of the pandemic has been the renewed interest in classical Catholic education. 
Chesterton Academy in Maryland is one of 14 new Chesterton Academy classical education high schools opening for the upcoming academic year, heavily adding to the 28 Chesterton Academies already in operation. Corpus Christi Academy in South Carolina is another one of many new Catholic schools in the classical liberal arts tradition that are getting ready to launch this fall with in-person, hybrid, or even online education models. The Archdiocese of Boston is also pioneering a new form of Catholic classical liberal arts education through their new Lumen Verum Academy that combines online instruction with real-world activities held at multiple sites within the diocese. Catholics across the U.S. without access to a Catholic high school in the classical liberal arts tradition now have an option with the new Oxford Collegiate Academy launching this fall as well. Authorities in Russia have returned a church to the Catholic community after a 25-year-long wait. The Church of Saints Peter and Paul in Novgorod, Western Russia was officially restored to Catholics on March 15th. Bolsheviks had destroyed the church in 1933, turning it into a cinema. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, local Catholics began to use parts of the former church for celebrations. Between 2009 and 2010, Catholics secured federal funds to restore the church's towers. They then succeeded in having the building recognized as a monument of federal value. Finally, they made several requests to use the church again. Bishop Nikolai Dubinin celebrated the first solemn liturgy in the restored church a quarter of a century after the first official request for the restitution of the property. And the French Catholic bishops have approved the opening of the beatification cause of a little-known but quietly influential Dominican priest, Father Marie-Etienne Vassier. Although he's relatively unknown in the Catholic world nowadays, partly because of the lack of available written works about his life and spiritual legacy, the French churchman remains a revered figure among the order of preachers, as well as in the south of France where he spent his life. Although his cerebral anemia didn't enable him to develop a systematic teaching, Father Vassier would recover enough strength over time to become a great director of souls. His writings, which have been long out of print, have been partly republished in recent years, and new publications are expected to accompany his cause for beatification. I'm Emily Alcaraz, and these are your Monday morning good news headlines through a Catholic lens. Praise be to Jesus Christ in all things, St. David Urbi Velasco. Pray for us. He was born on December 29, 1888 in Guero, Mexico. He was the son of Juan and Victorina, and the seventh of 11 children in, in, in a very poor family. He was baptized on January 6, 1889. He entered seminary at Chalapa in 1903 at age 14, an excellent student, by the way, would go on to be ordained in 1913 and become a parish priest and the secretary to Bishop Antonio Hernandez Rodriguez of Tabasco. In 1914, David and the bishop were ordered to relocate ahead of the anti-religious violence that was sweeping the country. Their ship sank, however, but uh, St. David and the bishop and four others did survive, and he had a very strong devotion to Our Lady of Tepeyac. On the 30th of July, 1926, as a matter of public safety, due to the anti-Catholic violence of the Plutarco Calles regime, the bishops of Mexico ordered a halt to public worship, and churches were closed. St. David was reluctant but obedient, accepted the order, but he later returned to his pastoral duties under secrecy. He, arrest, he was arrested on the 7th of April, 1927, but he was offered a deal. If only he would take it, he could have his freedom and his life. What was the deal? If he would agree to become a bishop in a schismatic church that would be cooperative with the Patarcochias government. He, of course, declined this. He set his house in order, setting up his last will and testament, and he was taken to a remote location. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his executioners. He gave them his belongings, and he promised them that he would pray for them in the next life. And then on the 12th of April, 1927, he was shot in the back of his head. In his last will and testament, he said, quote, I forgive all my enemies, and I ask God and whoever I have offended to forgive me. 
He would be canonized on the 21st of May 2000 by Pope St. John Paul II. St. David Urbi Velasco, pray for us. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Nicodemus, the ruler of the people coming by night versus the day, right? Um, there's a beautiful contrast there. And of course, we, as I said in the last hour, we have these beautiful double entendres at play here. But uh, lest you be confused by the circumstances of what's going on here, baptism by water and spirit is crucial to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus repeats himself several times. It is very clear. And it is reaffirmed. Just go to like the Didache, written in the mid-50s AD. And there were many copies throughout the ancient world that ex that survived. And it makes it very clear, baptism is necessary for salvation. Adrian, what did you find? So uh, one interesting fact about Nicodemus, apparently, according to Cornelius Lapide, um, and apparently in the old Roman martyrology, Nicodemus was mentioned there. So Nicodemus actually ends up becoming a saint. So it's Saint Nicodemus, ora pro nobis, pray for us. And he uh, was apparently, uh, he converted and believed in Christ and was in fact driven out of their city by the Pharisees because of his belief in Christ and uh, because of his office, uh, because he held a high office with, among the Jews. He was driven out because of his, of his conversion. And he was cursed by the Jews. And then uh, later on, he was martyred for it. And so that's why he is part of the Roman martyrology. I thought that was an interesting fact. And Cornelius Lapide has a whole section on this fact. But the point I want to get across for today is one I bring up often. And the reason why I bring it up often is because Cornelius Lapide, he brings this up quite a bit. And the reason is he was rising during the time of the Protestant Revolution. This was happening, and it's still happening today. Uh, many people, many of us Catholics, will encounter Protestants in our day-to-day -day life, uh, at work, at school, and whatnot. And uh, they will come up to us, and they'll start uh, using Scripture to try to destroy the church or to attack the teachings of the church. And Cornelius Lapide here points out uh, specifically John Calvin and John Calvin's erroneous idea against baptism. And so, uh, so Cornelius Lapide here says that if it be lawful with Calvin to rest this passage, then we may do the same with every other passage, and so pervert the whole of Scripture. No commandment will survive, not even the institution of baptism itself. And this is so important because until this point, this was not a disputed point. This is not a disputed point until the idea of wrestling with Scripture and tearing it apart and reinterpreting it amongst my own interpretation, where the Holy Ghost inspires me to, uh, to read Scripture on my own. No, this was not a tradition of the church. And Cornelius Lapide says, if you decide to do this, if you decide to take scripture into your own hands and translate it as you see fit, then you can, you will destroy every commandment of God. It starts off with baptism, uh, which is the most foundational of all the Christian life, because without it, you are dead. Uh, it's only in being born again of water that you are born into eternal life. And if you can destroy baptism, then every commandment of God can be destroyed. And we see that today. Wow. Isaiah chapter 44, verse three, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon 
upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. A foreshadowing of baptism. All right, we are going to go to a break. We're going to come back with Fear and Trembling, our Catholic trivia game show, where you get to be our contestant and possibly win a very cool prize this week. Brand new prize at stake. Here's the phone number. First caller always gets to be the contestant at 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. Call right now. 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Are there any basic rules for doing apologetics? 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense. Always be prepared, Scripture tells us. How can we always be prepared to make a defense of our faith? Rule number one, pray. Pray to the Holy Spirit that He give you the courage to share your faith and the wisdom to choose your words carefully and profitably. Rule number two, you don't have to know everything right now. Learn a little bit more about your faith each and every day. Read Scripture. Read the Catechism. Listen to apologetics tapes. Listen to Catholic radio. Learn a little bit at a time. Rule number three, Luke 5 verse 10. Do not be afraid. Henceforth you will be catching men. Jesus said this to Peter, but he's also saying it to us. Will you make mistakes and get into tight spots when you start sharing your faith with others? Yes, of course you will. But Peter made mistakes and he got into tight spots. Yet Jesus told Peter not to be afraid. Why? Because if we are sincere in our desire to share the truth with others, to share Jesus Christ with others, then Jesus Jesus will find a way to make good come from even our mistakes. Rule number four, always view a question about your faith or even an attack on your faith as an opportunity, an opportunity to share the truth. Rule number five, don't get frustrated. Catholics often get frustrated by what I call the doctrinal dance. You get asked about purgatory, Mary, the Pope, the sacraments, all in rapid fire succession. Before you can answer one question, you're asked another, then another. Just keep bringing the discussion back to one topic until you've said all you want to say, then move on. Rule number six, never be afraid to say, I don't know when asked a question about your faith. Don't try to wing it. However, always follow I don't know with, but I will find out and get back to you and make sure you do. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe. McLean. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, Fear and Trembling, where we have a secret and hidden agenda. It's a Catholic trivia game show. I have three Catholic trivia questions in my hand, and we have callers on the deck. But here's the deal. So just do me a favor and don't tell this to anyone. Don't share this publicly. But uh, we try to do some things here. Uh, One, we try to share a little bit about the faith so you secretly learn something new that you did not know before. And then, of course, we like to have a little laugh in the process, and uh, then we give out prizes. So it's kind of a win-win-win for everybody. But keep that between us. So here's the we don't ask the caller the question, so they don't even need to know the answers, technically. Uh, instead, we ask Emily, we ask Adrian, one of them will be right, and the other will be wrong. And every right answer goes into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Tell them what they could win, Emily. So this week we have a brand new sponsor, and that sponsor is Studio Send. That's S-E-N-N, Send. StudioSend.com is a shop run by a Catholic mother, Courtney Send, and she's an author and an artist. She wrote a children's book, You Were Born to Be a Saint, and she also makes all kinds of beautiful artwork. She does embroidery, watercolors, all kinds of stuff. And this week, our prize winner is going to win an Our Lady of Guadalupe banner that they can hang up in their home. Uh, It's beautiful. I really encourage you guys to check it out. We're going 
going to be linking it on all of our social media sites. sites. So, again, the website is studiosend.com. All right. Praise be to God. Now, I want to thank everybody who's tried to call in to be a part of our program. Tomorrow morning is a new opportunity. If you don't get on today, call early. It's fine. All the rules and even the phone number is listed on our website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Let's go to the phones. Good morning to you, Cameron. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Uh, now, you've been on before. If I remember correctly, uh, the last time you were on, it's been a while now, at least a couple months. And you, if I remember correctly, you knew when Butler's Lives of the Saints was published. You had that level of detail in your mind. It was amazing to see. Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, as I said as I said last time, I only found stuff like that on a random Wikipedia rabbit hole. So let's, <laughs> let's hope. Let's hope that. Uh, let's hope that one of the one of the other rabbit holes gets me a uh, gets me a prize. Well, we've never met a rabbit hole we did not love here at Catholic Drive Time, so uh, praise be to God for that. So then, as a veteran of the game, you know how it's played. You know Emily and Adrian will probably try to fool and trick you, so you have to keep a careful ear out. Are you ready to play, Cameron? Let's do it. All right. Emily, we will start with you, as is our custom. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? I'm positive. Okay, here we go. Emily, can you tell me which in the Holy Mass comes first? Which of these two things comes first in the Holy Mass? The Arate Fratres or the Lavabo? Now, let me say that in English. So the Arate is the uh, pray. It's where the priest turns and says, pray, brethren and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. He says that. Does that come first? Or does the Lavabo, where he has his, his hands washed, or he washes his hands? Which one of those comes first in the Holy Mass? I believe it is... Uh, I should probably pay attention more. I think this is the Arache Frates. Pray, brethren, that you're sacri- I think it's that one. You sure? I think so. Okay, okay. So pray first, then wash hands. That's your answer. I believe so. All right, let's see what Adrian has to say. Adrian, now you're an expert in all things Latin. Can you tell me which comes first in the Holy Mass? Is it the Arate Fratres or the Lavabo? Is it when the priest turns to the people and says, Pray, my brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father? Or is it that he washes his hands first? Which comes first in the Mass? Well, my uh, my Latin teacher would probably question you on being an expert on Latin things. Uh, <laughs> did not do great in this class. I apologize to my Latin professor. Uh, but I am going to go with Lavabo. Lavabo. The washing of the hands, you say, come first. All right, so Adrian is on the hook for the washing of the hands comes first, and Emily is on the hook for the praying comes first. 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who's wrong? Cameron, what say you? All right, so, man, my friends are going to kill me if I don't know this, but I believe it is lavabo first. The washing of the hands. Survey says, congratulations. <laughs> you got you, it you right. live another day. Rest yes. assured, your friends will not uh, bring back a burning at the stake today. Praise be to God. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe, but tomorrow's a new day. Maybe tomorrow. Congratulations, you are in the coffee cup of divine providence. That was uh, potentially a tricky question. But uh, we're very glad you got that right. Let's go to question number two. Adrian, you're on deck here. Uh Okay, now this is redemption for, was it last week or the week before? When I had the tricky question over John the 23rd. Ah, yes. (laughs) Uh, There was an an anti-pope, John the 23rd, and it it was a curveball, and our poor guest got it wrong. So this is me making up for that. Adrian, can you tell me, in what year... Did Pope St. John the 23rd, the actual Pope, die? What year did he pass away? 1965. 1965. Yes, sir. Hmm. Okay, let's see what Emily has to say. Emily, can you tell me, in what year did Pope St. John the 23rd, the actual Pope, not the anti-Pope, in what year did he die? I believe it was almost immediately after he opened the Second Vatican Council. So I'm going to say 1963, because I know the council started in 62. Oh, okay. Okay. Emily is on the hook for 1963. Adrian is on the hook for 1965. Who's right? Who's wrong? Cameron, what say you? Well, that's complicated, because Pope John XXIII, yeah, he did die before the end of the council, but... I'm going to say 65. Survey says... I'm oh, so sorry, Cameron. <laughs> Yikes. But I promise we will not tell your friends. 
tweet it to them right away. It's I will not right tell now. your friends that you got that wrong, Cameron. I'm so sorry. But it is, in fact, oh. from 1963. And Emily is right. She tried to tell you. She tried well, to tell you. The I council tried. ended in 1967, he, so he either way. He opened the council, and then he died pretty soon after. Yeah, that's right. Not that and long. Paul VI took over right away. Right away. Very eager, Paul VI was. At any rate, uh, that's another day, another topic. But let's go on. You got one more chance, Cameron. All is not lost. Let's see what happens here. This next one's a kind of a cool question. We're back with Emily this time. Emily, what happens... To the vial of blood every year. I think it happens actually twice a year, but if at least once a year, in the miracle of Saint Januarius, what happens to the vial of blood with the miracle of Saint Januarius? Okay, I don't know the whole story of Saint Januarius, but I do know that his blood is supposed to liquefy every year. And if it doesn't, that's taken as like a bad omen. It's a bad deal, huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're saying it liquefies. Yes. Solid and then goes liquid at least once a year. That's what I'm going to go with, yeah. Okay. Adrian. Adrian, I know you're an expert in all things miraculous. Can you tell me what happens to the vial of blood every year in the miracle of St. Januarius? Yeah, sad thing is uh, it did not do this this year. Yikes. Uh, what it was supposed to do, so a scary thought. But <laughs> the uh, it boils. It, 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 it begins to boil. The blood begins boils. to boil. Huh. Okay. Okay. Adrian is on the hook for the blood boils. Uh, Emily is on the hook for it liquefies. 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who's wrong? Cameron, what say you? Praise be to God. St. Janarius blood liquefied this year, and it will be a good year after last year, so it liquefies. Liquefies. Survey says... Well done! Yes. Way to make up for that last one, Cameron. You really <laughs> nailed that, and you are right. Adrian is definitely wrong here. It does not <laughs> boil. Unlike uh, <clears throat> unlike my wife's uh, blood that boils with me quite often, uh, St. Januarius' blood does liquefy at least once a year traditionally, sometimes twice, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And yes, last year there was an occasion where it failed to do so. And it was known. It was it was thought of to be a very bad thing. Generally, plagues, like, famine, and yeah. wars. Other than that, though, other than that, what's to you know? What's to be afraid of, right? Uh, well done, Cameron. How do you feel? You did pretty good this time. Two out of three ain't bad. Yeah, yeah. I feel kind of. Yeah, I feel kind of bad. I didn't get all of them, but you know, but, yeah, I just got to be on here. So praise be to God. Uh, well, Cameron, we're very grateful to you for playing the game again, being such a good sport. It's always a lot of fun. We're going to put you on hold. I, I'm going to make sure that they have your contact information. But if it be God's will, his divine providence, that your name should be pulled out of the coffee cup of divine providence uh, on Friday morning, uh, then uh, you'll get to get the prize. Praise be to God. Thank you to Studio Sen. What's the prize again, Emily? They're giving away an Our Lady of Guadalupe banner that you can hang up and display in your home. All right. Praise be to God. Cameron, God bless you and God love you and have a great day. Have a great day. God love you. All right, that is going to do it for the radio side of our program today. Praise God. Uh, a lot of fun playing the, the uh, Fear and Trembling game show. Tomorrow there will be another opportunity for three more chances. And if you would like to play, all you got to do is call that phone number and be our first caller. You can find that information on our webpage at grnonline.com forward slash cdt. CDT. So grnonline.com forward slash CDT. You can find the podcast information there. You can find uh, our sponsor links there. You can even find the game show information and phone number there as well. grnonline.com forward slash CDT. In the after show coming up in a few moments, if you are at all able to join us on a live video feed of Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, we would surely love to conversate with you. You get to drive the conversation, whatever's on your heart, your mind. We can uh, talk about the guest we had last hour or the fact that YouTube is uh, applying the heavy hand of discipline upon uh, the Catholic Drive Time team. Whatever's on your heart, we want to conversate. But God love you and God bless you tomorrow. My guest is going to be from an organization that will describe how many baby uh, aborted babies are used in your makeup or personal care products. Let that sink in. Aborted babies being used in makeup and personal care? Yes, we'll have that conversation tomorrow. Plus, Glory and Shine is going to be on our program tomorrow to talk about the counter-revolution using the beauty of the church to evangelize the world. 
All of that coming up tomorrow, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, right here on Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired is our goal. If you're going to Holy Mass, keep us in your prayers. We'd be grateful, grateful to you. Otherwise, we'll see you in the after show. God love you and God bless you. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Praise be to Jesus Christ in all things. Welcome to the after show of Catholic Drive Time, where we conversate about whatever you want to conversate, dear listener, whatever's on your mind, on your heart. Please comment. Let us know where you're from. And if you are a first-time commenter, will you get special treatment right here on Catholic Drive Time after show? We have a special thank you for joining our team, Sounder, that we like to play just for first-time commenters. So uh, if we don't catch that you're a first-time commenter. Please bring it to our attention so that we may properly embarrass. I mean, thank you and welcome you to the team. Um, but a lot of fun. Cameron was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, he did miss one, and I think his friends are on the hunt already. <laughs> um, but let's start thanking some folks here that are hanging out with us. Great crew over on Facebook side this morning. Praise be to God. Tons of shares. I'm very excited about the shares. Um Christopher Chance, of course, our, our, our good friend Patty was on with us this morning. Praise be to God. I see um, Luz. Luz, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out, Luz. We're always so glad to see you. Luz said uh, that she looks forward to Mondays now mm. because she misses us over the weekend. So oh, praise oh. be to God. That's Amen. very encouraging. That's so sweet. And Michelle Vaughn, praise be to God. Thanks for hanging out with us again this morning. And Betty. Now, I think Betty's a first-time commenter. Betty Lozano? That's right. Is, Betty. Have you ever seen Betty before? I have not. I don't think I have either. I don't know. We, I think we need to welcome her. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Welcome to the team, Betty. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for commenting for the first time. Praise be to God. Um, Let's see. Who else? On the Joaquin. I know Joaquin is here. Josh, Don, Paddock is here. Good morning to you. Tony. Good morning on Facebook. I know Lori was here. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Gloria, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Who's on YouTube? Lots of people on YouTube. We have uh, Thomas just joined us again. Mr. Thomas, who has been uh, absent for a little while. He said he was dealing with family issues, uh, so he wasn't with us the last couple weeks. So welcome back, Mr. Thomas. Eric is on. He said, good morning. Praise be to God. Uh, Chris Velasquez, he's back on the show uh, on YouTube side. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Valentin said, good morning, CDT team. Uh, Jennifer is on with us. She's up in uh, early in the morning. Susanna is up with us. My buddy Josh Patterson is on uh, talking about us uh, with big tech censorship. Angelo is on with us. Um, uh, did I already say Angelo? I think I did. Uh, Jesus is on with us as usual. So thank you very much, Good Jesus, morning. for being on with us again. We love to see our regulars here. God bless you all. And uh, I think there is no new commenters on the YouTube side. Everybody oh. is our our regulars. So Alex, praise be to God. Alex, uh, good morning from Colorado. Praise be to God. It's good to have someone on from Colorado today. Yes, Alex, he was our New Mexico caller yeah. uh, last Keep, Tuesday. Alex, it, look, this is what I need from you, bro, my brother. All right, so I need you to visit all 50 states for us and call in <laughs> every day from a new state. Okay. So that we can claim that we've reached all 50 states. That would be pretty neat. <laughs> Sounds like legit, doesn't it? I mean, yes. wouldn't it be cool? Yeah. Our, our, our reporter on the ground, Alex. <laughs> yes, Alex, he travels quite a bit for work, and so he's all over the place. So he was in New Mexico visiting his family, and he called in to uh, ask um, Michael Lofton a question. So that was that was great. And uh, now he's in Colorado. I don't know what he's doing in Colorado. I think he works in Washington, D.C. area. So what are you doing in Colorado, Alex? <laughs> Praise be to God. Jesus Robles is on with us, too, of course. Uh, it's always good to see our friend from Jesus. And we he, gotta... he was pretty disappointed in you this morning, Adrian. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> uh, can we put up the uh, Crucified Jesus cam for a moment? Yes. Uh, just because it's the epic Crucified Jesus cam. It's like very, it's almost Salvador Dali-like. 
isn't it? I, I mean, don't know. It has, Dali. You don't know who Salvador Dali is? What, what do you mean by that? Do you, do you know who I mean, Yes, right? I do. But what do you mean but by look that? At, look at the image, right? And the, look on the screen. Can you see the screen shot of that? It's almost got like this like almost Salvador Dali-like perspective to it. Only with an actually crucified Christ that's really crucified. Do you know what I mean? No. 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 You have no idea. Uh, does anybody else know what I mean? Am I the only one in the room who sees it? Like, uh, Salvador Dali has a weird perspective of things, right? His art yes. is very weird. Like, his crucified Jesus is, like, from the top down, right? He's looking from the top down. Right. So we're looking from the bottom up, and, and there's no actual wood, and it's just this, the shadow of his arms there. It just it kind of reminds me a little bit of Salvador Dali's artwork, but only more epic and awesome because the crucified Jesus is so epic. Here, ours, not his. Interesting. All right, okay. anyway, moving uh, on. Jesus's comment earlier <laughs> was amazing. He made a absolutely brilliant and astute uh, comment earlier in the show, and I you know, I just have to give it the justice it deserves. He said, uh, we are turning Joe into a Dominican. I can what? die in peace now. Oh. Praise be to God, Jesus. You're right. Okay. Uh, sooner rather than later, he <laughs> will holding, be a I'm, Dominican. I'm we'll holding get the up, Franciscan tendencies out of him. I'm holding up my San Damiano cross there. Okay, can you see that? <laughs> Father Francis is uh, is the dude. All right, so Father Francis, pray for us. Well, St. Vincent had Fa- Holy Father Francis appear as well. That's true. Dominicans okay. call St. Francis Holy Father Francis. You can keep Francis and be a Dominican. It's fine. Oh, he just can't Francis keep the rest of the Franciscans. Francis and Dominic were good friends. <laughs> were there's, they? There's art depicting them hanging out all the time. Mm, unless you're know. a skeptic and, do, and one of those people that don't believe they ever met. <laughs> Joe. Uh, Josh Null says, good morning. Good morning. Busting out the hard questions for Cameron this morning. Ouch. Yep. Must be a friend of Cameron, I'm guessing. I'm guessing it must be. Poor Cameron was a little, little nervous about his peer group being too hard on him today. <laughs> uh, Susan Weber agrees. Uh, she sees the Dali reference there. She sees the little hint towards Salvador Dali in the art there. Glad I'm not the only crazy person in the room, Susan. Praise be to God for it. Uh, Jesus says brilliant and astute. I don't know. I think he means me. I don't know. Could he mean mm. Adrian? I'm not sure. Mm, he not definitely sure. he's definitely <laughs> referring to himself, actually. <laughs> Him his comment being so brilliant and so astute. So brilliant. Uh, my buddy Alex said he is spending a day out here in Colorado before he flies out back east. Okay, so that's that's awesome. Cool. Praise be to God. It's good to have a little bit of a break and a deep breath. Valerie. Wait a second. What time zone is he in? I have no idea. It's what time zone is Colorado? For him. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Valerie said, I do too. She sees, uh, I'm, do you remember referring to Salvador Dali, uh, Valerie? Um, and welcome to the show. I don't think you commented uh, earlier today yet. So good morning, Valerie. Did you guys catch Fernando Fernandez? No, I don't think I did. New commenter. Is he a new commenter? I Fernandez. believe so. Where is he at? Fernando Fernandez on, on, on Facebook. Facebook. On Where are Facebook. you from, my GRN friend? Facebook. I think you're a new commenter. Please tell me if I'm wrong. You can correct me. I'm all right. I get used to it. Yes, because I want to play the hallelujah. <laughs> Fernando. Well, it's Where? either that or the horns of the apocalypse, which is, you know, popular demand by the audience, I think. Mm-hmm. 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 Betty also commented. She said, uh, just arrived. What's going on? Uh, that was probably like an hour ago, so I'm not sure what we were talking about. <laughs> Somebody then. got fired from somewhere. Oh, yes. Uh, we should probably now, bring that back up. Mr. Thomas wants to ask me a question. Uh-oh. So, uh, real quick, because we, we run out of time super early here on Mondays because Adrian has a job to do with a Bree Dale's program, which airs at 8 a.m. Central, 9 Eastern. So, we have to... We have to end early on Mondays, so let me just jump into Tony's question on Facebook real quick. He asked what commentaries we use for our gospel reflections. Um, I use the Catholic uh, Study Bible by Ignatius Press, which is Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch's commentary. I also look at the Navarre commentary, uh, which which most people think, at least at, at its core, is um, St. Uh, Escriva. And then I also will look at some other sources, uh, early church fathers or what have you, if I have time. I know when Emily's commenting, she really likes early church fathers. She likes to look at the original Greek as well. Uh, Adrian, his only job and role in life is to tell us what Cornelius Lapide thinks. And St. And, Thomas. And then throw in some of the uh, some of the St. Thomas and stuff Saint as Vincent well. And now. And now St. Vincent's added to the mix. Boy, your work is getting harder and harder by the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's... It, it's a lot of fun, to be honest. Not going to lie. Praise be to God. Um, so let me ask, answer Mr. Thomas, our friend from Florida. Praise be to God. We're so glad to have you back, Mr. Thomas Anderson. It's good to see you. But he wanted to know, 
At what moment did Joe realize he should be Catholic? That's easy. The moment uh, I was eating lobster dinner on the top of a mountain that I had carried this dining room set up there to ask my wife to marry me, and we were knee-deep in some lobster, and she said, you have to become Catholic. And I went, oh, no. I hadn't considered that before. That's kind of crazy. I was raised Protestant, Church of Christ. I was a Freemason. I was a third degree in the Blue Lodge. And uh, Catholic was the furthest thing from my mind. But I knew that God wanted me to marry her, so I had no choice, and so I joined the Catholic Church. But it was in April of 2002, when my wife wanted to divorce me after being married for only a few years, that I had a mystical encounter with Jesus that saved our marriage. And that moment set me on a wild ride of discovery of who Christ really is which I was very influenced by anti-Catholic sources, Protestant sources. And then it was a preacher named Alistair Begg, who is a Calvinist Scottish preacher with a Scottish brogue. He said that it was Constantine who corrupted the Christian church and, and, and brought in all this paganism that we call Catholic. And I thought, ding, 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 ding. All I have to do is study the early church, everything before Constantine was ever born. And I would know where to look for the true and actual church. And I studied the early church fathers. I read everything from the mid-50s AD up until 300 AD. And I mean everything. I read everything I get my hands on. So if, whether it was heretical, uh, like, the, like the, the Gospel of Thomas or Mary Magdalene, that kind of stuff, or I read, you know, the Didache, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin the Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, all that stuff. Um, and I remember, for me, it was the Holy Eucharist. It was whether or not Jesus literally meant for the Eucharist. And because my Protestant uh, neighbors and friends and family and all the, the preachers on the radio, they said it was all symbology. It wasn't actual. So I, I looked up, I found a, a translation tool a Greek translation tool, and I looked up every single word in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, and I discovered the literal meanings of, like, Sarx and Trogon, you know, the, the, the dripping flesh, the image of the dripping meat, blood meat flesh. This was what, you know, the images that we get in John's Gospel. Trogon, to chew, to gnaw upon the actual flesh of Christ. He wasn't being literal. I mean, he wasn't being figurative. He was being literal. And then, of course, uh, you couple that with what you learn in the early church fathers, even in, you know, uh, the Didache, you know, to receive the Eucharist, you have to go to confession first, uh, you know, or St. Ignatius of Antioch in his letters to uh, the Samaritans or to the, Philipp the Philippians or all, the, you know, he talks about the literal nature of the flesh of Christ be in the Eucharist. And you realize the church was Catholic from the beginning, and it... <clears throat> Blew, blows my mind. So anyway, I remember coming to that conclusion. I still struggle with the Pope, Our Lady, and the Saints. But I said to the Lord uh, after I finished my 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 review of John six, I said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And I gave my heart to Christ and to His Church, to His Catholic Church at that point. And He has been working on me on the rest ever since. So that's the short version of the story. Hopefully awesome. that's helpful. We're about to go off, and uh, just to accommodate my friend Jesus, Jesus is a friend of mine. I had to play it before Jesus the end of the show. So We need like the Darth go. Vader no on a button, too, <laughs> at the same time. No! All right, that's going to do it. Like I said, we have to end early on Mondays because Bree Dale and, uh, Joey. and Joey Mignon for Intersection is going to be on at 8 a.m. Central, 9 Eastern, right live here. It's going to be live on this channel as well, plus across the Guadalupe Radio Network is coming up, and Adrian Fonseca is their producer. From all of us here at Catholic Drive Time, we are so grateful you are a part of our, our inside circle, hanging out with us every day for the after show. It means so much to us. God love you. God bless you. Tomorrow we'll dive in, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, with another powerful show and guest, and we're glad you're going to be a part of it. God bless. Tell a friend. Share us widely. We'd be grateful to you. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.